Anna. And I'm Carol. And this is the Real Talk Recreation Therapy Podcast. On this podcast, we talk about real experiences and real research that back up the use of recreation therapy as a method of treatment for a variety of populations. We try to keep it real as we address concerns and successes that we and other recreation therapists have had as we all navigate this awesome career field. We don't have it all figured out, but one thing we know for sure is everything gets a lot easier when you can talk it out with a friend. But Jana, I was wondering if you, since I mentioned like a ton of different populations using cycling, I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the different settings that cycling has been used in, could be used in. Yeah, for sure. So again, going back to my professor, anybody can ride a bike. Also in any setting, uh, obviously there are limitations. There are probably in, in some inpatient settings where cycling may not be appropriate. But if if it is allowed in your program, such as a rehab hospital, I know there are a lot of physical rehab hospitals that have cycling as a daily program, outpatient for sure doing outpatient rehab, physical rehab, and even like drug rehab, community settings. There's a lot of community recreation programs. The city of San Diego is a great example of community therapeutic recreation programs that there were several, several different groups that use cycling as a modality and also in these clinical programs. And it's, I think when you extend cycling to include stationary bikes, you have a lot more options, right? Yeah. So even in these inpatient settings or in these clinical settings where maybe you aren't taking people out into the community mm-hmm. as much, you can still use, you can still use cycling, you yeah. use stationary bike cycling. So it's kind of cool. So really, I didn't, I didn't find really any setting where cycling could not be used. Although I imagine that there are some inpatient, more lockdown facilities and mm-hmm. things that maybe uh, that use could be limited, but anybody can ride a bike. You can ride it anywhere. I feel like the green eggs and ham, you could ride it here or there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a lot of a lot of potential for people in all sorts of settings to be able to engage in some sort of cycling modality, whether it's physically riding a bike out and around the community or just being able to use a stationary bike and getting those positive benefits that we talked about from the research, from that activity of biking. All right, so now that we've talked about the research backing up the use of bikes as a therapeutic modality, and we've talked a little bit about some of the settings biking can be used in, we have briefly mentioned all types of adaptive bikes, but Jana, I was hoping you could talk about just what adaptive bikes are out there, like what cycles exist, and I guess as well, like best practices in using them. Because when we use a bike, like obviously, we talked about how anyone can bike, but you have to be able to have like a bike that's fit for the person. Cause just like recreation therapy is very individualized. Cycling is also very individualized. So tell us about the bikes. (laughs) All right. Super excited. So I'm just going to start with the basics. So we've got our upright bikes, Mm -hmm. right? Which are the, the bikes that neurotypical people typically use. The standard two wheelers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most common are mountain and road bikes. And even though they're the most common, they're, they're pretty different from each other. They have very different uses. So, so I guess, first of all, when you're, when you're talking about an upright bike and you're talking about fitting, you're looking at butt, feet, and hands. Like does, can they reach? Is it a comfortable position that you're not causing you know, unnecessary wrist pain or knee pain, making sure that your joints are all okay and that you're comfortable sitting on the bike. Yeah. Um, For a mountain bike, you're looking at bigger tires, more simple gears, but they're heavy. They're a little bit more stable and you're sitting upright on them, right? So I think of mountain bike, mountain bike or a hybrid version of a mountain bike. I'm not thinking, you know, the really big fat tire mountain bikes that you go up and down the mountains of Hawaii in, but just yeah. like your, your typical, you can see it at Walmart mountain bike, right? Yeah, yeah. What I'm thinking of right here is I think a benefit of that is the the simple gear shift. When we did upright cycling at the soldier recovery unit, I liked taking our mountain bikes because 
it was easier for maintenance. And so that's really the, and it's also, you know, an upright position that maybe people are more comfortable with. Road bikes, they're going to be lighter, faster, and they have a drop handlebar position is what that's called. So if you can visualize, you know, it's hard to do on a podcast, but you, you know, you visualize the, the mountain bike, you're sitting up, road bike, you're leaning forward with these drop handlebars. So it's more aerodynamic and more versatile for gear and brake options. So for more advanced riders, this is great because you want more of those options. For Whereas for beginner riders, I have found that giving them less gears to play with usually makes the ride go smoother. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they don't know as much like how to how to adjust them. And as they get more comfortable on that, then transitioning them to road is what kind we kind of did at the soldier recovery yeah. unit. And I mean, that's true of our program, just because we typically were cycling more on roads than we were on trails. Whatever your program as a recreational therapist is, you may be using, you might just be using mountain bikes because maybe you're trail biking or mountain biking, or maybe you're only using road bikes. So that's the beauty of biking. There's like different adaptive bikes, and then there's different kinds of bikes based on the terrain that you're going to be cycling on. Yeah, so true. That's thank you. That's a very good point. If you are trail riding, don't take a road bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not saying that. We were just explaining like two different kinds of upright bikes and our use of them. Yeah, yeah. So what else is there? We got the standard upright bike that you think about, like this is the type of bike that a little kid learns to ride, but like what mm-hmm. adaptive bikes are out there? Yeah. So okay, so moving a little bit more adaptive, we've got trikes. So there are upright tricycles that are pretty much the same thing. They just have three wheels. People call them adult trikes or upright trike. And this is going to be pretty much the same thing. It's just super stable, right? You don't have the two wheels. Super stable, easy to get on and off. Not a racing bike. You're not going to go fast in it. People all over where I live currently use these as commuter bikes mm-hmm. to get around and it's a, you know, a leisurely ride. So there's the upright tricycle. Then there's the semi recumbent tricycle. This is really good if you have a uh, big and tall riders or big or tall, like because the seat is going to be leaned back a little bit. So there's a little bit more space for your legs and it's a little bit more comfortable. You have the stability with back support. It's a little bit easier to pedal. It's still not racing. This is what we used in our very first episode in season one. I talked about, you know, one of my happiest experiences or one of my great experiences learning to be a recreation therapist. This is what we used for the gentleman in San Diego when I was doing that that clinic and he had a C spinal cord injury. And so he he we we strapped him into this bike. So it's not quite as low as what you think of when you think of a typical recumbent bike, which was easier for us to get him in and out of the wheelchair and move him around and and kind of help him get into it. There was a lot of space for him and we were able to to maneuver a little bit. It's also up higher, which kind of makes you feel better if they're if they're going out on the road, it's easier to see. You don't have to have I mean the the flags are still a great safety feature, but maybe not as absolutely vital as when you have for a company. Yeah. And we will put pictures of these in our show notes too, just in case you don't, you can't like picture what a recumbent bike looks like or a trike. We'll have pictures of them just to give you an idea of what all these adaptive bikes look like. Yeah. And you can look at that on our website at realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. Yeah. Yeah. Links there. And then we have the recumbent bikes, which are low to the ground you're in a reclined position where most of your weight is supported by the bike. There's two types of kind of of these bikes. You've either got the two wheels in the front or two wheels in the back. So mm-hmm. the the delta trike is what it's called is where you have two wheels in the back and one in the front. So the front one does the steering. This was what most of our bikes at the soldier recovery unit were for. These are usually the best choice when maneuverability, versatility are priority over speed. And so you you want to be able to, you know, turn the corners <laughs> easier mm-hmm. and get them around. That was definitely um, important for us. 
the the tadpole trike is where the two there's two front wheels and one rear wheel let me try and say this word one rear wheel and the pedals power the rear wheel wow that is really hard to <laughs> rear say. wheel rear wheel <laughs> say that five times fast I had another recreation therapist tell me that the tadpole trike is kind of like the firebolt of the recumbent bike world if you're if you're into harry potter uh, the, it's kind of the the faster more um more competitive lighter faster better at better at handling that thing i was just gonna ask you so we have the recumbents for and the upright bikes and the trikes what if you are unable to use your feet to pedal is there a bike for that yes it's called a hand cycle <laughs> So this one, same same concept, powered by your hands rather than your feet. Brakes and gear shifts are all in your hands. And I've usually seen it in Delsa configurations, although I imagine that there are, you know, adaptive ones that are maybe semi-recumbent. I haven't seen them. So I've seen these in like the recumbent Delta where you've got the two wheels in the back, one in the front. I don't know. Yeah. Have you ever seen them in another configuration? I don't know. I haven't, but when I was doing research on just the different types of adaptive bicycles, there's like hundreds of kind of adaptive bicycles, just because it's something that you can individualize so much to the person that like some people may find more benefit in having like a different configuration. There's like different like forms of recumbent, like some more reclined than others. So I would imagine, and we can look this up and figure out if it's true, put it in the show notes that there's probably hand cycle bikes that are in the tadpole configuration. I know that there's definitely ones that are more competitive because yeah. competitive like hand cyclists are many and very versatile. One of my professors was a very competitive hand cyclist, so I'm sure he could tell us. So then we have our tandem bikes. Bicycle built for two. One person is in control of the bike and another person is biking, but maybe needs some assistance controlling the bike. So you would call the person that is in control of the bike, the pilot, and the person that is assisting or being assisted, the stroker. So typically in a typical upright tandem bike, you have the pilot in the front steering and controlling and the stroker in the back doing as much as they can. So I, I did this as a program with individuals with visual impair impairments in San Diego. And I, I would be the pilot, they would be the stroker. And you really, the stroker really doesn't have to do a lot. There are times that we're like, Hey, can you pedal? <laughs> like they really don't have to, if they don't, if they, if they get tired or if they, if they need a break, it, it doesn't stop the bike from moving <laughs> or it, I guess the pilot can control it enough. So this is, you know, totally a really beneficial option for individuals that want to get out on a bike, but maybe they're worried that they don't have the endurance or you know, the, the confidence to do it solo you can have them with you and they can participate as much as they feel comfortable. And then, so that, that's like your typical upright one. Then there's the has bikes Pino. I believe this is a German company, right? Carol has bikes. That's what we think. We'll find out. We'll put pictures of all these bikes in our program notes too. So like if the way that we're describing it just like, doesn't make sense, we'll, we'll get a picture so that you can see it and be like, okay, I understand what Jana's saying. This is a very visual episode, I feel like, so yeah. please look at our show notes, realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. We'll have pictures and notes for you on these. Mm -hmm. So this is a tandem with a recumbent. So you have the pilot, the person controlling the bike in the back, and then you have a recumbent bike on front, in front. So if someone doesn't have the trunk control to be able to be in an upright bike, they still want the assistance of a tandem, you have this has bike. Again, anyone can ride a bike. Then there's also the duet bike, which what Carol was discussing in the research. This is the wheelchair bike or the bike where one person is the pilot is pedaling and the other person isn't expected to do any any sort of pedaling. They don't even have they don't even have to have like pedals, right? They it, it's just a seat. So the, the wheelchair bike Duet Pike, tri, tri Shaw. These are all names for a bike that is basically a carriage. I kind of think of it as. Yeah. There's the the pilot is 
driving you around, but you have all of these other benefits that we, we just learned about that are still going along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though you're not the one pedaling the bike, you still have that experience and freedom of riding a bike. Yeah. It's amazing. (laughs) It really is. And then if none of those really fit you or you need some sort of combination of that, then you've got the hybrid bikes, which could be a combination of a hand cycle and a recumbent allowing for both hand and foot power. So I'm thinking amputations or spinal cord injuries where maybe you have some, some motor control in your legs. So this is used if the rider cannot power through using only one. They can't just do it with their feet, just do it with their hands. It can be used with a pedal that moves to keep in cir- circulation in legs, even if they aren't providing power. So your, your trunk and legs are weaker. So the hands are helping or vice versa. It's really cool. Yeah. It, when, when we talk about how you, they have the bike, like the hand cycle and the foot cycle consecutively like together in one bike they're talking about how it can keep circulation in your legs so that would be for somebody who maybe has a spinal cord injury or like for whatever reason doesn't have movement in their legs the bike your feet are still locked into the pedals and they're still moving your legs so it's kind of helping you keep that circulation to your legs even though your legs aren't what's powering the bike like your hands are still pedaling it but your legs are locked in on that cycle so they're still moving so you get that move like the, all the benefits of moving your legs moving those muscles without like actually powering the bike with them. Like your legs aren't what's pushing it, but they are moving. We're not done. You guys Mm -hmm. are still listening. There are e-bikes, electric assist bikes. So you can go longer than you could on your Mm -hmm. own, you know, and, and I believe that there are electric options in all of these categories. So super cool that technology is making it so that everyone can ride a bike, even Mm -hmm. if you had you know, low aerobic power or for some reason couldn't go as long as you wanted, take it on an e-bike, make it easier. Yeah, I was recently talking to a woman that I met on an airplane who is in her seventies and she was telling me about this e-bike that she got, just got, and she's really excited about it because she's enjoyed cycling all her life. But now as she's a little bit older, she doesn't have the same endurance that she used to have. So she really likes the e-bike because you can have the option to, the bike will like power it for you. So kind of more like a motorized bike where like you're not actually pedaling, but then they also have pedal assist where like, you're still getting some of that like aerobic exercise benefit, but the bike is helping you keep going so you can go longer and further. And I don't know. I just think that e-bikes are really exciting technology for everyone really, but especially for people that maybe have troubles with their endurance and want to like keep pedaling and just being able to keep going. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Harking back to the research article that you shared about how they discovered, you know, people do this for enjoyment. And so if we can help them continue to enjoy, this is, e-bikes is a great solution to, I can't do what I used to. Mm-hmm. Can you do it with an e-bike kind of thing? Yeah. And then the TheraCycle was what you talked about in a lot of the research where it's a stationary bike with a motor that they called it in the research forced exercise right Which... it did yeah it's, it doesn't sound very recreational therapy like because we don't like to force people to do things but that idea was just that the motor is what is pedaling you so it's kind of like forcing you to exercise but not in a not in a way where like someone's like no you have to not exercise in, way. Just in the same, no. the same idea as an electric bike right it's just stationary yeah. it's really cool so yeah if you if you wanted to get on the bike and have it kind of help you go further and all of those benefits mm-hmm. And your feet are strapped into the bike. So it's not like your like feet are falling out of it. Like they have a, a shoe that you basically like put your foot into. So it stays stable while the motor like assists you to pedal. So it keeps everything safe and gives you that aerobic activity. There are so many different types of bikes that I mm-hmm. hope is the takeaway from. <laughs> my yeah, life. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but like we said before, Cycling can be very individualized and there's lots of ways to fit bikes, to fit whatever adaptations that somebody may need to be able to keep doing this. Yeah, for sure. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a quick break to remind you all that all of our research guides, as well as our show notes, can be found on our website, www.realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. If you're looking for those resources, go check it out. Okay, now back to the podcast episode. That is our brief explanation of anyone can ride a bike so now you 
got the bike. What are some best practices when facilitating a group? What are some things that you want to think about before you go out, Carol? Yeah. So as recreational therapists, using a more physical modality such as cycling, I think it's really important to take into consideration safety. You want to make sure that your participants are out on a bike and they're going to have a good time. They're not going to have an accident where they fall over and hit their heads and it's just like bad things happening. You don't want that. So the first thing I want to look at before I take anyone cycling is their experience level. Some people have never ridden a bike before and I think it's a good thing to make sure you understand if someone has ridden a bike before. Working with adults, it's easy to assume like surely everyone's learned how to ride a bike, but it's not true. Not everyone has learned how to ride a bike. So knowing their experience level and also knowing just how comfortable they are on bikes. So I had one participant that I worked with at the soldier recovery unit who she was in her 40s, had never ridden a bike before. And I was taking her out to do a bike fitting where we kind of size up the bike to make sure that like their hands reach the handlebars while they sit on the seat and that their feet can touch the ground so that they're able to ride in a comfortable position and also stop themselves when they don't want a bike. And I didn't realize that she had never ridden a bike before. She didn't necessarily tell me that. I guess I hadn't asked, which was not a good thing. It's like a horror story. So <laughs> she like gets on to ride the bike, doesn't know how to brake, like has to jump off, like falls over. It was just really bad. So it's important to understand how experienced your <laughs> bikers are and also how comfortable they are because even if they have ridden a bike before it may have been a while or if they're using like a new kind of bike for example if you're used to riding a mountain bike and then you go to the road bike where the handlebars are a little bit different they have more of that like streamlined where you're going to be hunched over shape to them it's important to like understand if the person is going to be comfortable on the bike you want to, before you take them out, you want to go over, how do you brake? How do you shift gears? Like, is there anything about this bike that you may not know so that when they're operating the bike, they know how to stop themselves. They know how to move stuff. Like what you shouldn't do with the bike, for example, if you sh like should only shift gears while the bike is moving. The next thing with safety, and this really depends on the spaces that you're biking in. If you're going to be taking people out on a road to cycle, it's good to have have everyone on the same page for different hand signals for direction. So there's the standard like right turn, stop, left turn, like arm movements. But I think we found that not everybody knows those signals. So when Jana and I would take people out biking, we would just point in the direction that we were going because I guess we can't assume that people riding cars know what all those directions mean. And it was just like safer for us to point so that the cars that were driving on the road where we were biking would have more of an idea of where we're going. So just making sure that all your participants know what the hand signals are, whatever form you're going to be using so that like if you're if you're having a group of people biking together, they know that, okay, up, up here, this whole group, we're all going to turn left, we're all going to turn right, so there's not confusion about where you're going. And then it's also important for you, the recreational therapist, to know the route that you're taking, right, Jana? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> so my first, my first week at the soldier recovery unit, which is really the only excuse I have for it is it was my first week, but at my first week there, the, the PTA, the physical therapy assistant, it was also his first week. And we were leading a bike program with our, they call them cadre in the military. So we had our soldiers that were in recovery, but we also had the staff that worked with them and everyone was riding a bike together. So it was a big bike program and the, the physical therapy assistant had found a route that he was planning on all of the things, but then the company commander uh, decided that it was time to go. So he got up and said, okay, guys, here we go. He gave the safety brief he did not know the route that the the physical therapy assistant had decided and he was also new the the pta was also new so we just kind of stood back and let this commander tell people where we were going and what we were doing and it was not safe for recumbents and we had a woman that was nervous but determined on a recumbent and there was a very steep hill and there was a crash and everyone is fine, but it was, it was, it was bad. And it was a, a good learning experience realizing that, oh, we're going down this hill. We, we, we didn't stop them before we realized where it was going. It was kind of, the whole thing was kind of a crapshoot. So 
make sure you know the route and don't let anyone change it for you. Yeah. So that it's safe for the bikes that you have and the ability level of the people you have. You can't say yes. enough. And that's the great thing with like planning a cycling session is that beforehand you can go out and map the route and know, okay, are there any hills here? Are there any weird corners? Like being able to find a space, maybe if you're cycling with newer cyclists, you might consider keeping it on flat land, like having smaller spaces, like not going too far, just all these things that are really easy for us to plan in advance that are going to set us up for success when using cycling as a modality. And then I think another thing that's important for safety is before you take people out on a route, and this could even be like part of your cycling program, like you could have multiple sessions where the first session, just few sessions, you're not really taking people out cycling on any sort of long ride. You're just practicing with them all the things that they need to do to ride the bike. So that may be like had practicing getting on the bike, practicing pedaling, practicing braking, so that when you eventually do work yourself up to taking them out on a ride, they are able to do it safely. Practice makes perfect. And so it's really good to just build that into whatever cycling modality that you're doing. And then the last thing that I wanted to say for um, before you go, things to think about with safety wise is just to make sure that you have all the proper waivers and activity clearances for your participants. This really depends on your program. But like if you're doing a community rec program, you probably have some sort of safety waiver that you want to make sure that your participants have signed and filled out. And then also, if you're working in any sort of medical setting, there's probably some sort of clearance that those individuals need just to make sure that the people that are going to be cycling with you, it is safe for them to do so. It's not going to be impacting them in any negative way. They have doctor's approval or whoever's in charge of that in your program has cleared them. So you're not going to cause more harm to them by having them cycle if it's not something that's appropriate for them to do. Yeah, so true. Making sure that, you know, just cover, cover your bases, make sure everything is covered there. Yeah. So that's kind of all the things that are, I guess, maybe not all the things, but all the things that we thought of that you should consider before, before you're doing the cycling modality. So Jana, while you're facilitating a cycling modality, what are some of the things that a rec therapist should be doing, watching for? Take us through it. Things to pay attention to when you're taking a client out. I think a really quick summary of this before I get into it is continue your assessment as you go. You've assessed, are they comfortable? Do they know how to brake? Do they know how to shift gears? And then you're continuing this assessment as you go. So you're continuing to monitor their comfort level. Do they seem more nervous or more comfortable as you get going? Are they pacing themselves? Are they able to carry on a conversation with you? Or do they seem really out of breath? Are they using the bike? Do you see them use the gears at all? A lot of times I'll show people how to use the gears and and then we'll go out and maybe they're not using the gears. It's hard. It's new. Maybe you've, maybe you've never used gears on a bike or maybe you have never used them in this way. And so just kind of continually assessing that and continually kind of coaching, especially in the beginning with a new program. So I'll ride next to someone and say, here, try pushing your thumb forward, shifting the gear, really walking through it with them using that leisure ability model, right? I'm going to walk it through it with them. I'm going to coach them, do this. And then maybe after a couple of times riding, I just let them shift gears as they feel comfortable. I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that I think about when we're, when we're going out. And then I guess also being willing to adjust your route, like, like have a backup, you know, like, oh, we thought that we could go five miles, but actually we're going to, we're going to go home here or we ran into road work or, you know, this, this area is no longer safe. So having mm -hmm. knowing that area well enough that you can adjust worst case scenario, turn around and go back the way yeah. you can. Right. Like, you know, but just kind of making sure that it's safe for everyone and giving them the practice and then being able to slowly extend that as you get going from our, from Pete, our, our bike, our bike guy at the soldier recovery unit, he always really emphasized having multiple facilitators going out. And he really liked having a bandwagon behind us. So we'd have like one of the drivers drive behind the group so that if someone got tired, they could go sit in the van, things like that. I think having multiple facilitators is really key if you have more than two, probably, because 
and and even maybe with two because mm -hmm. biking everyone is on has their own power to go their own pace and it can be really tricky for for the therapist to know i need someone i need to be in the front so that i can you know take us the correct direction but i also want to be in the back so that no one is falling behind so unless you're in a very small group where you can watch everyone and everyone is kind of at the same level i would definitely recommend having at least two of you go out or say we'll do this in shifts. I'll take you out and then I'll take you out kind of thing. It's just to yeah. say for that. I've never had, I've all, every bad thing that has ever happened to, to a group that I've been with when we were cycling happened because someone went too far ahead or like left the facilitators behind kind of thing. Other best practices, just, just looking at the bikes, just doing maintenance before and after just a brief check, you know, the tires and, and bringing bike tools out with you. We really liked having bikes kind of assigned to the group if it was consistent, because then you don't have to readjust the bikes each time. This is especially important if you have recumbent cyclists, because those bikes are not designed to be adjusted each time. I remember we had the the cat trike, which was our tadpole bike, the, the firebolt bike, the recumbent, you know, the fast one. And we had someone that was really tall that wanted to use it. And we had someone that was really short that wanted to use it. And it just, uh, it, it's just not designed to be moved that way. Better for recumbent bikes, better to have one that is for a taller person and one that is for a shorter person. They don't adjust the same way upright bikes do, or at least this one didn't. And so assigning the bike so that you know you know it makes it easier for you to get out that got out of there quickly like okay this is carol's bike this is jana's bike and it it lets the participants know hey i'm used to this you know shifting this way and it's not yeah those are those are the big things that stand out to me is there anything that you're thinking about that i'm missing carol i think you covered a lot of the safety things and like those logistical parts of facilitation um Obviously, as recreational therapists, usually we have some sort of therapeutic aspect to the modalities that we're doing. So this is also a good time to be watching how your clients are doing with cycling, like keeping their goals in mind, whatever it is that they're working on with cycling, whether it's a social goal, maybe you're biking in a group. So you want to just see how the participants are doing socially, if they're engaging with other people, if it's a physical goal, like having them improve their endurance or learn skills on the bike, being able to pay attention to how those skills are developing, how they're doing with them. I feel like those two are the easiest ones to see with cycling. You could also be looking at if the person is getting frustrated or not, if your goal is to work on frustration tolerance and like if they are starting to get frustrated cycling, like what can we do to work through that frustration? And maybe today's not going to be the best day to do the complete program, but like we'll work up to it, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that would be the other part that we talk about while we're cycling. Yeah, for sure. That's great. And then afterwards, what are some, you know, again, continuing on with the therapeutic aspect of that, what are some debriefing things that we can talk about with the clients to understand, you know, things that maybe we missed as we were facilitating, understand what how it went from their perspective and how they were making their goals? Yeah, definitely. I think like something, a huge thing that can make these more physical modalities therapeutic is being able to debrief with the participants, like what they did during the session so that when they leave the session, they kind of have those ideas fresh in their mind. And so first of all, I just like to focus on the positive with people that I cycle with, like asking them, okay, like what went well about this session? Like, how did you feel about how you were cycling? What did you enjoy about it? If you're like, it's also good just for you as the facilitator to know, like, if the bike worked for them. So asking them how they felt about the bike that they used. Maybe they are new to upright cycling and maybe they really like the mountain bike. So they want to keep up with that. Or maybe they might want to switch to a road bike or they feel like it needs to be adjusted, like asking them those questions so you can make those changes later. Just understanding how they felt about the distance of the bike or the length of time that they were cycling to be able to adjust that for next time. And then depending on the type of program that you're offering, if you're looking to give the client more control over the cycling group and like, if they're kind of the ones that are kind of trying to like build up what they're doing, asking them what sort of things they want to focus on for the next session. Obviously that's not going to be appropriate for all populations. Like for example, if you're using a wheelchair bike for people with dementia, you might be focusing more on like their emotional enjoyment of the thing than like 
what you want to get out of it physically, but like physical rehab, it'd be different. Yeah, definitely. You know, know your clients, know your program, know their goals and ask them based on that. That's great. Uh, so <laughs> Team Army. So as Carol mentioned, with the Soldier Recovery Unit, we we helped soldiers that wanted to become athletes participate in what is called the Warrior Games. And the Team Army has has coaches and mechanics that can that come out and help teach and adjust and give us all really good feedback for how we can improve our program. So we reached out to John Quink. He is Team Army's bike mechanic about some of the things to look for when maintaining cycling equipment. First of all, we want to thank John for giving his time to answer these questions. He answered a lot of kind of our more technical questions about cycling that we didn't feel we could necessarily share with you guys with the expertise that we wanted to. So we will share that in our show notes. So much to look for in these show notes for this, these episodes. We just wanted to share really quick his advice on maintenance. He talks about the main things that you're kind of looking at with maintenance, because that is a huge part of cycling is this equipment like trying to maintain this equipment because as Carol mentioned, it can be expensive. So once you get it, you really want to keep it forever. <laughs> and so yep. for as long as you can. And so the real things that he said to look at were chains, tires, brakes. And so I'm just going to read this, this quote that he sent us uh, real quick about it. But those are kind of the, the overall of what he's saying here is, is what to look for. So he said, Figuring out what's wrong with a bike always requires a quick look over. Chain on or off? Flat tire or tires? Has the bike been sitting outside for a long time? These are common issues. Some of the common issues that come up in cycling is not checking the wear items of a bike, and they include chain, brake pads, and tires. If you don't check your chain for wear periodically, you run the risk of having to change the cassette and chain rings, and that adds up dollar-wise. Brake pads, if worn down too much, can ruin a rim brake wheel or a disc brake setup ruins your rotors. With tires, it's wearing them down to make them more susceptible to punctures or blowout. When in doubt, bring your bike to a local shop to check these items. A good shop does not charge to inspect these items. Amazing. And one thing to be aware of, if you're thinking, well, okay, taking a bike to a mechanic, sure, but I have a recumbent bike. How are they going to fix that? A really cool thing about cycling, the cycling world, is that the mechanics of it are pretty much the same is what the mechanics that I have worked with have told me is that the mechanics of it are pretty, pretty similar and have the same sort of brake thing, the same sort of chain thing. And so mechanics that are used to looking at upright bikes can look at your hand cycles. And maybe every once in a while, we definitely ran into issues every once in a while where there was something that was unique to the recumbent bikes, but far and away, the the mechanics that could could inspect our upright bikes could inspect our recumbent bikes. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So I guess other advice that we have on maintaining bikes, uh, do it every time you go mm -hmm. before and after. This was something that, again, Pete, our, our great physical therapy assistant and bike guru at the soldier recovery unit really emphasized every time before we'd go out, we would check all of the bikes make sure gears, tires, and brakes were all working well. And then every time afterwards, we would do it or we would have the participants do it, which is a really great way to help your participants be a little bit more invested in the maintenance and invested in making sure the bikes are are treated well, have them, you know, how was the brakes? How are the gears? How are the tires? Help them be aware so that when they leave your program, they can continue to cycle on their own. As for storage, I know it's so hard because they take up so much space, but if you can keep them inside, they're going to last longer and keep it neat. You don't want spokes in pedals that's going to, you know, break a wheel irrevocably. So one thing that like a thing that we would always try and do is, is stack them frame to frame, pedal to frame wheel to wheel, that kind of thing. Don't, don't let any of the wires and chains get, get messed up. <laughs> you have to be a little, you have to be a little particular, I think, when you have mm -hmm. several bikes to make sure that you can get them all where you need them without, without ruining them every time you put, 
them away and take them out. Mechanics, I was personally really overwhelmed about doing mechanics when I first started doing it. <laughs> definitely helps to have a mentor. YouTube is a mentor. <laughs> and so <Yeah. laughs> it definitely helps to have, but really you're going to learn by doing. I feel a lot more comfortable after you know three years of trial and error. I feel a lot more comfortable maintaining bikes now than I did then. And so if you, if you're uncertain about the basics, let's say, you know, find someone, even going to the local bike shop and asking them if they'll show you what they're doing when they're checking the brakes or checking the chains, explaining to you what's happening can go a long way in helping you to feel comfortable identifying when your bike needs maintenance. Anything else, Carol, that I'm missing on the maintenance that you want to add? Well, I think one thing that's helpful too is it's helpful to have on hand the tools you need to adjust bikes. So like when we would take participants out on the bike, we would always try to have a multi-tool with us that included, was it an Allen wrench, I believe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the tool, whatever tool it is, you need to be able to like adjust seats. So like, you don't want to be a mile out from your place without the ability to move the seat up and down. It's helpful to have all of your maintenance equipment, like bicycle pumps, extra tires, like that sort of stuff in a place that's easy for you to get to. We usually would pump up our tires before we did each session. And then we would have a tire pump at the ready in a place that was easy to get to around the area that we were doing our sessions in so that if we needed to inflate a tire more, or we were just ready to go with that. So we didn't have to run upstairs and get it again. Also make sure everyone's wearing a helmet. We didn't ever actually say that, but <laughs> getting bicycle helmets, like that's a really important and easy part of safety considerations to make and probably should have mentioned it earlier but yes have a bicycle helmet 100 i am yeah. such a fan of don't bring in anyone else wear a helmet while riding a bike i don't care who you are like it's just re a really big safety thing for your head definitely there is no the helmet is cheaper than a cat scan is what a yeah. fire told me and and, <laughs> and i don't know anyone that you, you know uh, it's, it's, it's worth it. It's worth the, it's worth the helmet hair. It's worth the uncomfortableness. You are protecting your brain. It is important. And you can get Lysol and spray them out at the end of each session when they're all sweaty so that they are clean and ready to use for the next session. So you can also assign people helmets or they can bring their own helmets if they're not comfortable borrowing helmets that you get, but yeah, helmets, wear them. <laughs> so lastly, we have talked about all these different types of adaptive bikes and all sorts of populations and settings you can use them in. I just thought it would be fun to shout out and recognize some um, cycling and adaptive programs that exist in the U.S. So we went through and looked at some of them. So the first one is called Adaptive Adventures, which I believe, has that group come to Oahu? Do we have experience working with them? I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Probably. Probably. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, so there's a lot of different adaptive cycling organizations that exist in the U.S. and globally, and a lot of these organizations, they will do things like set up adaptive biking clinics, they can um, help teach people how to ride bikes, there's a lot of initiatives for people to get out and ride bikes. So the first group that we found in our brief internet search was Adaptive Adventures, and this group serves children, adults, and veterans by not only providing them with adaptive cycles, which... Unfortunately, adaptive cycles can be a little bit of a cost for people. So some, there are some organizations out here that their mission is to get those bikes into people's hands that can't afford them. And also Adaptive Adventures, this group that I'm talking about, they'll provide adaptive recreation clinics, which includes cycling, to help people that have never ridden adaptive bikes, participated in adaptive cycling, kind of learn and get comfortable using the equipment, getting into this form of recreation. Another group that we found is called the Adaptive Cycling Foundation, and this group is super cool. They build adaptive bikes for wounded service members and veterans. So if you go look on their website, they have different funds right now for like veterans that they have selected to build a bike for, and then they raise the money for them and then build the bike for them. So it's a really cool program. There's a lot of programs like that that will help provide adaptive bikes to people that can't afford them. Also, if you are working for an organization and you are looking to get some of this adaptive equipment but don't have it in your budget, one thing that you can look for are different groups that provide grants to be able to get adaptive equipment. And I feel like we could one day do an episode on grant writing because 
like oh, yeah. a really good way for recreational therapists who maybe don't have quite a huge budget to get a lot of the equipment, adaptive equipment that they could use for their programming. So one group, and I guess this group is kind of more for organization or is for individuals, not teams organizations, but they're called the Challenge Athlete Foundation. And what they'll do is you can apply for an annual grant to get adaptive sporting equipment, which would include cycles. And this is for individuals that have a disability who are looking to start competing, who want to compete, but just don't have the equipment needed for it. So this might be good if you are working with somebody who is interested in getting more into cycling on their own, wants to compete, but doesn't necessarily have the ability to afford to get a bike. They can apply for a grant and then possibly get it. You just can't do it for your organization. So like, it'd be a good thing to refer to people, not necessarily for your organization to write the grant for. I would say it's honestly kind of cool because usually when I think of grants, I think, oh, you got to be, have an organization behind you. Mm -hmm. So really, really spectacular that this is, for anyone. So maybe someone that isn't around an organization that would be able to provide that they can have their own. That's great. Yeah, definitely. The other group that provide last year, they provided two, two, not good with numbers. Is that $2 million in grants to members, Mm -hmm. to its member organizations in their network each year. And in 2020, over 80 member organizations received adaptive sport program equipment and grants. This is called Move United. So they are an organization that has, I guess, a good amount of money to give to organizations to provide them with adaptive equipment. That is incredible. The program that I was talking about earlier, the the one that is about the the wheelchair cycles or the, the carriage where someone is cycling and people are riding is called mm-hmm. Cycling Without Age. And its its mission is to help older adults be able to have these, have these program, have, have this program in their assisted living center or in their local recreation area. And there's programs, like I said, they're international. There's one in Singapore I'm going to go check out, but there's several in America that I've looked at too, where their, their mission is to try and get these really nice bikes into these, these people's recreation areas. Yeah, definitely. Another thing you could look at if you are an individual or someone working with individuals who want to get more involved in adaptive cycling is that sometimes parks and rec departments will have these, this equipment available that you could like borrow or rent, or they might run some sort of program to teach people how to use adaptive cycling. So it really depends what area you live in, but a quick internet search can show a lot of different organizations that do things with cycles in different areas. And you could probably go to your local recreation area and ask them and and let them know that this is a need in their community and then they can work on their end to get this this equipment available yeah definitely so that brings us to the end of our episode i know we shared so much information over the course of this episode so we're going to have a lot of that information summed up in the show notes we've got our research guide where we talk about all the different research studies that we looked at when we were preparing for this episode so you'll be able to see that And then we'll have pictures of all the bikes that we talked about and links to all these organizations that are involved in adaptive cycling. Yeah, I think cycling is just such a really great modality. I think it's really exciting to see that there's research that backs up the use of it, not only for physical benefits, but also social, emotional, cognitive, like it has benefits in all those areas. So we hope that you as a recreational therapist listening to this will just kind of feel more excited about the modality of cycling and maybe have a few more resources at your hands to be able to get more into cycling. I know when I was researching this episode, I was identifying individuals, my grandparents, (laughs) my Mm -hmm. friends. I'm like, oh, this bike would be perfect for you. This bike would be perfect for you. So I hope that you guys listening are getting some of that too and have some good ideas for what you guys can do. Yeah. All right. Well, as always, thank you again for joining us for this episode of Real Talk Recreation Therapy. We hope that you found lots of helpful information for your practice as recreational therapists. If you're looking for some of the resources that we mentioned, you can go to our website, www.realtalkrecreationtherapy.com. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. Bye!